Hello, dear friends, and welcome to the Geo Coast. Um, today I've been visiting the 45th annual conference of the Association of Irish Geography Teachers of Ireland. And here I'm standing with the president of this association, Peter Leiden. Hello, Peter. Awesome. How are you? Great to meet you. Um, it's been an interesting conference, and yeah. thanks for inviting me yeah, to talk at this. Yeah, it was great. nice to give some, uh, to share some experience with the teachers. Yeah. And can you please uh, tell me, like, what is this association about? Okay, so the, the Association of Geography Teachers um, is a voluntary association of teachers. We have branches around the country, and we provide um, in-service programs and uh, continuing professional development programs for, for geography teachers. And we tend to respond to the needs of teachers. So we, we will get requests for sessions on regional geography or settlement or economic geography. And we just provide CPT sessions for, for teachers to, um, so that they can um, improve their teaching and learning in the classroom. And how long have you you've been the president of this association? Um, uh, well, it's actually for the last two years. So. It, Tends to go in two-year cycles. I should be coming off now this year, mm -hmm. and somebody else hopefully. Is there an election on. process or how does it work? Um, well, it was, really depends on if if there's more than one person wants to go, then there mm -hmm. will be there's an election process. But but the last while we've just had worked on nominations. So um, yeah. So, and what's your own background? Have you been teaching geography all your life, or what background are you coming um, from? Yeah. So I I um, I did a I did an undergraduate and a master's in geography in UCD. Uh -huh. um, and um, when I came out, I tried some sub-teaching for, for a while, substitute teaching. Um, and then I decided to do what was then called a higher diploma in education. Um, and then I, I, I landed a job teaching um, part-time in the current school I'm in. And then eventually I became full-time and, and permanent there. So I'm there a little over 25 years now. Right. In the same school? In the same school, yeah. Okay. yeah. Perfect. That's the way it kind of works in Ireland. Is it's really difficult to move between schools, uh -huh. really. Um, and are so. you happy the way things are? Now, when you say the way things are, Max, <laughs> uh, there's so much that needs changing. Um, uh, in education, um, we're going in a very positive direction, I think, at the moment. Um, there are a couple of negatives there, I think, that could be corrected and should be corrected. Um, the biggest one is that geography is no longer in the core of the junior cycle curriculum. Um, that needs to change. Anybody who knows anything about child development mm -hmm. and education and the importance of education, um, to well-being both in society and in the economy has to recognise the importance of geography and indeed history uh, in the lives of citizens of the country. And they really should be returned to the, to the core curriculum. Um, geography, we, we're surrounded by it. it. It's raining out today. We had a couple of talkers mm -hmm. talking about, speakers talking about climate change today. Um, we had the protests uh, last week, the climate strike. We, we, um, we're surrounded by geography and for it not to be a subject that every student does, uh, for them to be um, deprived of that entitlement mm -hmm. to study geography at, at junior cycle really is a, sh it's a crying shame. So can you explain to, to somebody who's mm -hmm. not familiar with the system yeah. when you say core subject means it's compulsory? Yeah, so up until, um, up until the, the introduction of the current junior cycle, we used to have a junior certificate program. Um, so that had a three-year course of study and then a, an exam at the end. Before that, it was the intermediate certificate that was also three years and then an exam at the end. And in both the intercert and the old junior cert, um, geography and history were in the core curriculum. It's provided for in the rules and programs for secondary schools. Virtually all schools did it. Um, in the new um, junior cycle, only English, Irish and maths is in the core curriculum and everything else is optional. So some schools have dropped geography, which is just... Beggar's belief. Because there wasn't enough interest. No, it, it, they've dropped it because they, I think there's a flaw in the justification in the junior cycle. There's a framework document. Um, they initially, initially, that framework document looked at getting rid of this idea of subjects. Mm -hmm. And instead, that students would study themes really was really the way it was going. And that system is, has been shown to be flawed. In, in Finland, they're already rolling back from that, um, that type of teaching. Um, but the, the upshot of it is that schools now have the freedom to decide whether or not they want to have certain subjects in the core. So I, I visited one school last year um, which decided to drop modern foreign languages. Um, and that's a kind of an illustration of where things are going because if, if there's no requirement to do the subject in mm -hmm. school, 
um, people will see that there's no opportunities for them to gain employment as a geography teacher, a history teacher, a languages teacher, and so they just won't train. Mm -hmm. And so it's not surprising. We have about we have a shortage of about two and a half thousand teachers in the country at the moment. Geography teachers? Or no, just generally two and a half thousand. And that's going to get worse and worse and worse because it's simply not, it, it's become a less sustainable profession mm -hmm. um, than, than before. And the way to ensure that we can get teachers is that if teachers know that there are going to be jobs available for them, it's like any profession. If they know there's going to be jobs there, uh, people will train for it. But they, the uncertainty is there. Um, so with regard to geography specifically, um, you know, you look at issues like Brexit. You look at the, the sheer ignorance around the, the significance of the European Union in terms of trade and, and indeed development within the European Union. Um, you look at... Um, People who time and time again in interviews said, you know, well, I voted to leave, but I didn't really understand the issues. And you're going, that's, that's a lack of geographical mm -hmm. education right there. And we know what a mess Brexit is. Um, and hopefully the same thing won't happen here, but that time will tell. Yeah. You know, like in my talk, I was giving a recommendation to, to teachers um, yes. to use more field trips yes. as part of their teaching yes. program. And then a few teachers came up to me after the talk and said, actually, by regulations, we allowed only one field trip a year. Is that true? Uh, okay, so it would be right. Like so it would be incorrect to say that you're only allowed one field trip regulation a year. That's that's incorrect. Mm -hmm. um, so you can't do more if you're enthusiastic. Absolutely. It, it, this comes down to school leadership, and I'm sorry to the principals mm -hmm. out there. It is about school leadership. Mm -hmm. um, the one field trip that that teacher was talking about is the Leaving Cert geographical investigation, uh, which um, Leaving Cert students study, and it's the they complete a reporting booklet, which is 20% of their Leaving Cert examination mm -hmm. in geography. Um, so they have to undertake a field study for that. Um, most schools are doing much more than that. They're doing two, three, maybe four trips. Um, we, we have three at the moment. I'm looking to expand that so we, we can personally, have and you're teaching like you're teaching junior or senior? I'm, I'm teaching junior cycle and, and senior cycle. Uh -huh. So I would teach all the, all the way up. Um, so if you take a particular group of pupils, how many field trips do you do within nine months? Um, well, so this well then uh, on the assumption that the teacher could do more, um, it would be really hard for a school to have more than one in each year for that particular for that one subject. Mm -hmm. But you, you have to bear in mind as well that. Um, in most schools, there are other opportunities for trips, um, but within geography, it, it would be really hard to justify more than one, one, mm -hmm. one trip a year. If you could do more, that would be fantastic. Um, but having said that, um, you, teachers don't need to do, you don't need to organize, you know, get the buses and go down to, mm -hmm. you know, two hour drive. You, you can do a field trip around the school. You can get students outside of the buildings. And, but you can and do it once or twice, but then it gets boring. To look at the same area. Yeah, it, 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 yeah, but there are things you could do. Like you can. That's one of the things you, actually I wanted to say today, but I didn't have time. Yeah, yeah. Um, it does. You, it does. But you know, there is the practicalities of running a school and mm -hmm. administering a school and making sure that everything runs smoothly. And of course, when if a teacher goes out, somebody has to cover the rest of their classes. Mm -hmm. So to be fair to your colleagues as well, you, you can't be taking field trips every single day of the week, you know, or every other week. And what's your personal? Um, how do you personally approach your own self-development? Do you only kind of study books, encyclopedias, internet, or do you go out in the field collecting oh, some footage yeah, that you yeah. use in your Obviously, lessons? Obviously, this is, this is the thing about geography teachers, Maxim, this is the thing is, um, you know, when, when we go on holidays, uh, like you, you, saw, you saw there, um, I had the wind-up caterpillar mm -hmm. to just, it, it kind of illustrates how glaciers move. I, I'd be in a shop and I'd see something and I'd go, oh, that's great, I can use that. Mm -hmm. I can use that to teach. Um, you know, I have the SpongeBob SquarePants to, to, to show scale. Um, so you, you're, even when we're on holidays, we're, there's still something in the background while we're thinking there. of something. And, uh, Photos and videos from oh, the colleges yeah, that you can yeah, use in the class. Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I've, I think I've got, I mean, I've got a hard drive full of geography photographs. I home mm -hmm. just geography photographs. And uh, I think I've got more geography photographs than I have family photographs, which is a terrible admission to make, you know. But... Um, yeah, no, we're all the time looking at looking at things. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. It's good. It's at least it's replacing kind of field experience by showing them the real life examples. Uh, yeah, yeah, and I've, I mean, look, you look at today, like, I and mean, we look. I mean, not everybody can see outside, you know, but um, I, uh, w I, I try to convey to my students in class, you know, that, you know, if if they were here, they might walk in, they might even not, not notice the fact it was a hotel yeah. or whatever, but I'm I'm looking at transport networks and I see cars and I see climate change and I see the weather and so I, I, I live in this 
permanent bubble of geography. But then we all live in a permanent bubble of geography called the Earth, you know. And, yeah. Peter, I know that in 2017 you published um, your textbook, your own textbook in geography. So could you please tell me like why you wrote it in the first place and what makes it different sure. from other textbooks on the market? Sure. Um, well, I, I, I had a website, um, still have, geography.ie, which I, I had been using to put up materials um, for my students. And um, in, in 2017, then I was approached by Folans and they asked me, would I, um, would I write a textbook? They're, they're, there was a new specification coming down the line. So um, I couldn't get involved in that until the new specification was out. And um, so I, I took it on and I was keen that when we were writing it, that we would, we would approach it differently to the way that it's normally done. So typically an author would write a script, hand it over to the publishers with um, you know, suggestions for images. And um, I, I kind of wanted to do it slightly different and Folan's you know, they, they, they took a risk um, and um, they, they said, OK, look, what do, you, what do you think? And I said, well, we have to write a book that, that isn't just one that teachers can use. It has to be one that students can read. Um, mm -hmm. So um, and I, I had certain ideas from the research on, on, on that, that that could that could have backed that up. Um, it um, the, the images, I had very particular ideas about the images. So I sourced a lot of images and then they were handed over to the to the image editor. So rather than the image editor finding the images that I suggested, um, I, I went looking for the image I wanted and then we tried to get the nearest the nearest one to that. Um, and then when it came to um, the, the diagrams in, in it, um, I drew a lot of those by hand on the basis of my own experience of what I found worked with my students. And then we took a particular approach to them, which is a sort of a call out approach, which gave the book or parts of the book a sort of a, a comic like a comic book like feel mm -hmm. uh, to, to some parts. Um, and even things like the font, um, we, we spent two weeks discussing a font um, that would um, the students would be familiar with on that gap between or that bridge between the end of primary school and the start of secondary school, you know, and we looked at things like making sure that T's had tails on mm -hmm. them and, and the A's were familiar A's that they were used to at primary school. Um, so when we put the whole thing together, um, um, you know, I, I didn't just write the script with, with my co-author Tara Fitzharris. We, we, we literally designed it the way we wanted it to look. And um, we, the two of us together, we produced this, this, this text, which the feedback has been great so far. And, um, and it's, you know, it's great to see people using it. And then on top of that, uh, which for me was really exciting, was um, the Irish version was translated by COG. COG is an organization that mm -hmm. they, they, they're in the same building as the NCCA. And they translated it in, into, um, into Gaelga. And it's just fantastic to see it in the Irish version. It's just really great. Um, so yeah, it's it, it it was a bit of a roller coaster because it's intense, you know, sixteen hour days um, on top of some teaching as well, and um, uh, it was intense, but with very enjoyable experience. And um, are you using it now in your teaching? Yeah, I use it. My and, and you know, um, we we got in all the samples of the books, and I passed it around to my colleagues, and there were pros and cons on on every side, and. And in the end, they, they, they chose mine. And do you know how many schools using you? I've, I, I don't know. I, I don't know. Um, I, I, I couldn't tell you. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah, no, it, it just any, anybody who is using it that I spoke to, um, actually invariably they, they spoke to me, it. and they, they like it, yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's, um, it was a great experience because it, it, um, I, it immediately introduced me to the, to te to, you know, the basics of teach, teaching the, the mm -hmm. new course because you, you have to know how to approach every single topic that's on the specification um, and every single learning outcome uh, in order to produce a text. And so it worked out quite well. Yeah, yeah I picked up a copy today from the publishers. So oh, yeah, great, great. Like yeah, actually, I, I tell my students, right, which because it, it might sound a bit strange, but um, we're used to thinking of textbooks as something that, you know, you put on the table and you hunch over and you study, right? And I said to my students, I said, look, you know, tonight you've got a bit of homework to do. I want you to read page eight or read page 15. I said, make yourself a cup of tea, put your feet up and just read it like you would read a book. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'd give them a couple of homeworks like that where they, they could just enjoy reading a text um, because so much now is, 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 um, is you know, there's, you know, literacy is so important that we want to encourage children to read and, and to read for interest and not just to read because they absolutely have to read, you know, because mm -hmm. part of the course, but yeah. Um, 
it, so you enjoy reading that and I'll, I'll be looking forward to your feedback okay. on that. Just to go easy on the coastal chapter. <laughs> okay. And getting yeah. back to the field trips, you said like, yeah. okay, normally you do one big field trip a year. Yeah. Personally, where would you take your kids? Yeah, so we, we have, for my six years uh, for the geographic investigation, uh, we, we have two sites that we go to. One is uh, the Inchivore River at Loch Dan, um, just around the corner from Loch Tay in the Wicklow Mountains. And there's a lovely river there, um, and it's got a meander. So whenever erosion and deposition are on together, we go to um, the Inchivore River. If it's deposition and transport, um, I prefer to do coast. So we go to Shangana Beach and Shankill. And so that's where we went this year because the geographical investigation this year is the impact of deposition transportation processes on one landform. So we, we chose a beach, a nice clear landform. Um, landform, you mean like a sand dune or a sand wave? Or? Uh, well, in this case, a beach. Um, but as one deposition as, as one deposition landform. And that particular beach has some very interesting characteristics to it in, in that it widens as you, as you move mm -hmm. south. Um, and so it's a very interesting, it's an interesting beach. But it could be, you could do a sand dune, you, you could do a lagoon, um, you could do a spit. Um, just, yeah. So it means like a student or his pupil must kind of uh, research and describe this topic on a particular example, is it? So what they do, it, actually it's quite, quite, it's quite detailed. So um, they have to decide on the hypotheses and the objectives that they want to uh, achieve. I shouldn't say objectives now actually because they've removed that word from the the introduction section of, of the GI, but they have to decide on the aims and hypotheses. So um, they would do a planning um, section, so they would need to look at um, um, the activities they want to do, the equipment they're going to use, um, and they would need to practice those activities. And then they go on the field study itself mm -hmm. and they would um, conduct those activities in the field. They would collect a set of data. That data would form the basis for their results. Um, they would then try to draw conclusions from those results and then they would evaluate the entire project. And so they write this up in a booklet, uh, it's a thousand word booklet, mm -hmm. give or take. Um, and then they submit that and it's, it's 20... like a mini research project. It's a research project, yeah. Mm -hmm. And it, it is, it, it is um, it's, it's more or less along the lines of the scientific method. And, um, and so they, they, they produce this. Um, the field trip is great and the learning is fantastic, but the actual writing of the booklet can be uh, tiresome for some students. Like um, handwriting or computer? It's handwriting, but for students who have a computer allowance. So some students are allowed to use a computer. They, would, they, they can use a computer. And in fact, there's a, you can actually get oh, an electronic so you're version. Not, you're not encouraging students to use computer? It's no, like actually, people well, people it's... People who can't write, yeah. they can use a computer. So I thought in modern day, like, you, really you need to encourage to use the modern. graphical packages. And um, they, look, there's, there's opportunities there for students to use ICT, and they should use ICT just as a... It's a, it's a useful skill for them to practice. So, so let's say... Um, so my students would do a sediment distribution analysis along the beach, mm -hmm. and they would look at stone sizes. So um, I haven't done this with them because we, we just got straight down and did our graphs, but they could put that into Excel. But, but they already know how to use Excel, so it's not really a skill that I need to take them up to the library mm -hmm. to do or whatever. Um, they, um, so they just produce a table on, on the graph paper. But um, one, even though ICT is encouraged within the framework of the geographical investigation, um, students couldn't produce an Excel table and then print it off and put it in. They're not allowed, you're not allowed to stick anything into the booklet. Mm -hmm. um, and so in the end, everything ends up having to be done by hand. And the only time that a student would um, type anything would be if they have an allowance that, for, to use a computer in their exams. Um, and even then, they're going to be drawing some things by hand. Mm -hmm. yeah. What do you think of the suggestion I said today that instead of um, forbidding phones, mobile phones in school, you should uh, use this weakness as a strength and use it as educational tool, use them in class, use them in the field as oh, a very powerful oh, mapping not, tool. You're not going to like my answer. <laughs> you're not going to like my answer. Okay, so... Kind of going with the trend. Here's the, the things, trend. folks. Here's the things, folks. Do not give your child under the age of 16 a smartphone. Partly I share this view, but at the same time, if they already have one, it's, it's like a drug addict. You can't take it away from oh, them. Oh, yes, you can. <laughs> <laughs> but then you, they're going to be upset. It, they're not going to like it. You. It is. It's. It's. You know, no. Sure enough, it is. It's very difficult. Um. And, and for and certainly for kids who have them and had them for any length of time, it becomes their. It's their social anchor. Mm. It is their social anchor. Um. I don't think. I don't. I don't think any. I don't think any child under the age of sixteen should have 
unfettered, unsupervised access to the internet. But what um, I'm talking about is using educational resources so, through the phone, like watching educational video on YouTube yeah. or using Google Maps to so, do some mapping project. To... Yeah, I think this is, I think this, so the, the key thing here for me, uh, and just to be clear on it, mobile, mobile phones are fantastic. Um, um, my own kids don't have, mo don't have smartphones, but, mm -hmm. but they have a brick, they have a brick phone. So I can contact them mm -hmm. if, if I need to, okay? It's just, internet, uh, just uh, messages and, and phone calls. Um, my, my key thing is unsupervised, uncontrolled access to the internet. Okay, so that's, that's the issue for me. Um, if you want to give your kid a smartphone, fine, but you need to supervise. I, I would suggest that you need to supervise their use. Um, there are certain programs which allow you to see the traffic and which sites they're visiting. Yeah, kids are smart. Okay, yeah. kids are smart. You can get by all that, right? But I think in school, I think the, um, there's, if we broaden that to mobile devices, um, there's huge scope there. Now, look, I'm, I'm, I love technology. Um, I, I, you know, my, my first, I used my first computer when I was 10, um, back in the dim mists of time. And um, I, I, I love technology. Um, you know, I, I've done work with the PDST on ICT uh, in the past as a facilitator. Um, you know, I've, I, I have a, an MSc in e-learning. Um, I, I love technology, but it's a tool like any other tool. And I think it should be used in, in moderation. I think in terms of, I, I mean, I've, I've seen schools where their, their, their claim to fame and their ICT use is books on the mobile device. Mm -hmm. And that's not a claim to anything except you might save the weight of school bags. Um, you can do a lot more with mobile technology and you should do more with mobile so technology. So kids bringing iPad instead of textbooks? Yeah, yeah like for example, well, I, I mean, kids could leave their books at, at home and mm -hmm. the school could have whether, whether I don't, see, I, I think what should happen here is the state should fund IT properly in schools. Mm -hmm. um, and there is funding from the state for that, but it's not to the extent of providing mobile devices mm -hmm. um, for children in, in, you know, broadly or generally across across all schools. And and what, are the, what are the current regulations, Peter? Are mobile phones allowed in school? Okay, so it varies from school to school. Um, some schools allow it. I think increasingly, um, and schools are saying no, no, no personal phones between nine o'clock in the morning, four o'clock at the end of school uh, at any time. So increasingly schools are doing that um, because they're real. And, and in fact, we did that in our school um, in, in Wesley College. It's been a fantastic success. Our, our children have reported that they feel better about the fact that they don't use mm -hmm. their phones um, because it, it, it doesn't distract them then during the, during the school day. Um, so it's, it's, it's been a positive for us. And I, I think in future that's the way all schools eventually will go. Yeah. But personally, I remember teaching first years at university and those people came straight after school. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And obviously at university, you can't forbid phones or anything mm -hmm. like they're free people. Like mm -hmm. I remember 200 students sitting in the class, everybody in their phones, on their Facebooks yeah. or whatever. Mm -hmm. How do you fight this? And I just implemented. You tell them to put them away. No, I, I never said it. I just continuously throughout the lecture, I was asking them questions to make sure they understood what I just said. Mm -hmm. And when they realized, and I was picking people from the crowd to answer mm -hmm. those questions, yeah. and then there were uh, multiple choice tests after the lecture. Yeah. So once they realized that they actually have to listen, the problem disappeared yeah. after the second yeah. or third lecture. Yeah, because they learned. So same at school, maybe if you keep them busy and yeah. bombard them with well, questions. Well, there is research from Cornell University that shows that um, students who, who type notes type more notes mm -hmm. than students who write. So if you use a computer, you will type more stuff. Mm -hmm. But students who write... of course on, the, on typing skills. Oh yeah, ab well absolutely. But the students who write remember more. So typing and writing by hand are two fundamentally different cognitive skills. Mm -hmm. and, and I think the first thing you should say to your students is, if you write, you will remember more. Now, you've got to be careful here, okay? Because, and we have to be fair, not everybody finds writing that easy. We, we have students who, who, there are students who have dyspraxia, who might have difficulty writing, and typing is a lifeline for them. And, and, and so they should be allowed to type. But as a general rule, handwriting is better than typing in terms of trying to remember material. Mm -hmm. um, oh, I personally prefer it as well, even when I'm thinking about some project yeah, ideas, yeah. I just write them down. Brainstorming, that's, yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, having said that, I'm a, I'm a big fan. There's a, there's a fantastic Microsoft Office product plug plug uh, called Microsoft OneNote. Uh, I've been using it since 2003 when it came out. It's, it's a digital notebook and you can write on it with a digital pen. 
Uh, it's just gorgeous. It's fantastic. Uh, one note. It's just, never tried. Yeah, oh, it's great. It's fantastic. So, mm. Peter, um, since the geography was made uh, not a core subject now, what can you say addressing young people? Why do they need to choose geography? Oh, do you know what? I think young people know. Um, the, the problem is where the choices stack up in the school and, and students can't choose it. So it, it's funny because the, the very people who have taken it out of the core curriculum will say, well, if the subject is exciting and interesting, students will choose it. No, they won't. That's a false choice. Um, they, if, if you have a choice between what you think you might want to do, what your parents might want you to do, what the school is capable of providing, um, then you don't, have a real, you don't really have a real choice there. And th but this is the point, is that that school I told you about earlier, um, who, where they made modern languages optional, the reason they did that is because they can't get the teachers. And they can't get the teachers because the job is not there. So if the job is, is there, um, and if it, if it pays well, and we know there's issues there with two-tier uh, pay scales, um, then it will attract in um, graduates. And we, we don't just want to attract in graduates, we want to attract in you know, highly skilled graduates. And the way to do that is by ensuring that if they train as teachers, there is a position available from in school. And I'm not talking about, um, you know, there's a, there's a lot of NQT teachers, newly qualified teachers who are, um, they're subbing, they're on short term contracts, um, and they're finding it really difficult just to get their, their foot into a full time job that's secure and stable and that will justify the investment that they have made in their education. And, and that will allow them to exercise their their passion and enthusiasm for the subject that they teach that will rub off on, on the students that they, uh, that they come across in school. So if, if we don't create the right conditions for people to take up the job, they're just not going to take it. Um, simple as that. And um, when it comes to geography specifically, um, I think what we need to do is we need to say it's in a core curriculum. You know, we have English, Irish, Maths in the core curriculum. They are there in the core because somebody obviously thought that these were important for students to do, that they were so important, they ought not to be left to chance. The same would apply to history and geography. The same logic applies. So why history and geography can't be in the core, but English, Irish and Maths is just beggar's belief. And I, I, I just think that arguments to the contrary just lack integrity and, and you know. And Peter, what is your view into the future in terms of the development of the Association of Geography Teachers of Ireland? It's been there for like 45 years. Yeah, yeah. yeah. What, what Longer. Is, what, is, what is your vision for the future? Okay, so, so we have, um, we, we have a, a branch in Donegal, a branch in Ballina, we have a branch in Galway, we have a branch in um, Navan, based in Navan, one in Dublin, uh, we have a branch in the South East, um, and we have one in the South Midlands, um, which will be coming back on stream shortly. And we have one in Munster, which was in abeyance for one or two years, but that's beginning to come back on stream. Um, next year, the Teaching Council will um, publish its um, findings, uh, or essentially it'll be its policy on continuing professional development. So we're moving into an era where we, teachers will have to undertake uh, a certain amount of continuing professional development um, every year. Um, I'm hoping that, that, that the model that they adopt will be a broad model um, that will recognize many different forms of continuing professional development. I mean, potentially, you know, um, this is this could constitute that, um, for example. Um, certainly the conference would be a classic example of something that is continuing professional development. In the United Kingdom, um, teachers get um, CPD credit for attending events like this. Um, all the teachers who attended here today, or nearly all the te teachers who attended here today, um, did so voluntarily. They're, they're, they, they don't get necessarily get credit for it. They're here because they love the subject and they're interested and they want the best for their students. So it would be important to see that that's recognised in, in the, the Teaching Council CPD policy. Um, I'm, I'm really um, very hopeful for the future of the association when that policy comes in because I think it will encourage more teachers to get involved in the association. Um, and, and to do so, not just because it's, it's good for the association, but because it'll be very good for, the, for their own professional development. Um, you, you saw there today um, the, just the opportunities for teachers to network with each other and mm -hmm. to learn off each other. Uh, Therese Ruddle did this fantastic session on lots of different teaching ideas and people are just writing all these notes down because they're going, I, I'm going to do that on Monday. That's like a great idea. So, um, so I, I, I'm very hopeful for the future um, of the association, um, um, but particularly going in, into next year with the, the CPD policy coming on stream. Okay. Thanks yeah. very much, Peter. Maxim.
Thank you for talking to us today. It was a great talk. I got a great reaction. Thanks. And uh, I think people really enjoyed it. And we're going to have you back.